Good morning. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here. And if you're uh, new with us, please feel free to fill in those uh, uh, registrations along the aisle. I'm Tom Jacobs. For 40 years in Pennsylvania, they called me Pastor Tom. But now in North Carolina, I'm just Tom Jacobs. I uh, am here because your pastors are at annual conference in Greenville. Every once in a while, the bishop says, we're going to... We're going to do our conference over Sunday, and a little what, in a little bit, they'll be doing ordination today and their closing worship service. It'll be a grand moment for those who are gathered. You may or may not know it, but United Methodist clergy elders are not members of local churches, never are. They're members of the annual conference, and so this is their church their place to worship, their body of Christ, uh, in addition to what they find when they come to serve in a local church. So uh, as you understand the United Methodist Church a little more, you'll understand how important this time is for them and the continuation of the church into the future and our call to be disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Isn't that what we're all about? Uh, I'm glad to be here today. I uh, was, uh, as I said, a pastor for 40 years. It's been a while since I preached, so I'm hoping it's like riding a bike, that you get back on and it feels normal and uh, you can just go. Uh, Pray for me, pray for our worship as we begin our time together. The only announcement I know I need to emphasize is that Vacation Bible School starts next Sunday evening. And they're still in need of some volunteers. It's time to register children. If you have children in your family, if you have children in your neighborhood, if you have children that you meet somewhere, see if you can get them enrolled in Vacation Bible School. It's a life-changing kind of experience for kids. And it'll be a wonderful house full of energy here for a couple of nights uh, next, next weekend and beyond. Uh, <clears throat> anything else you want to add to that, Scott? We're going to have a last. Uh, he <laughs> Central. We've got four different churches coming together. Uh, we're expecting about 80, 90, maybe even 100 children. Uh, so this place is going to be rocking and rolling uh, next week. So, um, and also, after the 11 o'clock service, if any of you like to help us decorate, set things up, we'd love to welcome to come back. Come back this morning? <clears throat> is that, no, next week. Next week. Yeah. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> As we prepare for worship, let's pray. Oh God, you're present everywhere. There's nowhere that we can ever go that you're not. And yet we come to this place to feel your presence, to recognize your spirit moving among us so that when we go back out into the world, we can see it more easily, feel it more closely. So help us to prepare our hearts and minds to worship you in spirit and in truth today. We pray your presence with all who've come and with all who lead. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Let us stand and worship our living Christ Christ this morning with our senior pastors away and so many things happening in the world that perhaps cause us to be a little uneasy or worried or fearful. I thought it might be good to sit and keep God on the world in his hands. He's got the whole 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 world in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. In his hands, he's got 
got you a new sister in his hand he's got me a new sister in his hand he's got the whole world in his hand
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb we sing. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. You've done for me. All that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. All that you've done for me.
Precious Lord God, sometimes the craziness of this world, the craziness and busyness of our schedules cause us to feel like the last thing we want to do is get all dressed up and come to a church. And But boy, this is where we need to be. We need to come and start off this week and every single week at your feet. It sounds so trite, but boy, we need our batteries charged. We need our gas tank filled up. We need our sins forgiven. We need that new start. God, may this be a new beginning for us in your grace and mercy and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> it's now time for the children's message. If the young disciples will please come and join me up front here, please, on the steps. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open up your eyes, it's baffling for the wise. Baffling. Is that a new word for you? Baffling. You got it? What, what, what does baffling mean? Basically, it means it's confusing. Okay, or, or overwhelming, uh, yeah, confusing, overwhelming, like can hardly figure it out, can hardly believe it. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open up your eyes, it's baffling to the wise, but open up your eyes and see. Now, God is a God of surprises. If you think about it, uh, both the Bible and modern-day science say that creation came out of nothing. Nothing. Everything that is, just, you know, like the Big Bang, just from out of nothing, everything came that is. Genesis says it this way, and God said, let there be light. Let there be the beginning of creation. And there was. What a surprise. Everything that is came like that from the hand of God. God's a surprise. Now, when God chose a group of people to be his Old Testament people, he could have chosen the Canaanites or the Moabites or the Hittites or the Egyptians. They were a big, huge nation. He chose the Jews, the Hebrews. A small little group of people not known around the world at all. God's full of surprises. He seems to choose what we wouldn't choose. When 
The Hebrews needed someone to go up against Goliath, the giant Philistine warrior. God could have chose Saul because he was the tallest of all the Hebrews. Who did God choose? Bingo. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. He chose David. And who was David? A little shepherd boy. Wow. God is full of surprises, right? God's a surprise. How about when God came to earth in the person of Jesus? Could have been born in a palace. Could have been the child of a king. Where was Jesus born? In a stable. What? A feeding trough. They laid the baby Jesus in a manger, which is a feeding trough. Absolutely. God's full of surprises. God does things differently. And God's mother was, uh, I mean, Jesus' mother was uh, a little Jewish girl, young Jewish girl, uh, maybe 14, 15, 16 years old, maybe. Um, and wow, that's a surprise. That's different than we would think. Um, and then, at the very end of Jesus' ministry, you would think that if Jesus was the Son of God and, and God wanted everybody to believe that if they were going to come after Jesus, Jesus would be on his right and his left would have thousands of angels and he would defeat his enemy. And, but that wasn't what happened. God allowed Jesus to be crucified on a cross. And even when he rose again, which that was a surprise, very few people saw it. God does things differently. God's a God of surprises. And even to this very day, when you ask God to come into your heart, God sends his Holy Spirit to come and live in you because you are so special to God. God is just full of all kinds of surprises. And God might meet you today in some of the most simple little ways, maybe in a butterfly. I saw a bunny rabbit this morning. A little sign of God, just, you know, here I am. I love you. Here's a little butterfly gift. Here's a little... Sunrise, a little sunset, just to remind you that I'm with you. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open up your eyes, it's baffling to the wise. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. Open up your eyes and see. Now, the scripture lesson for today, the Old Testament lesson, is from Genesis. And it's the story of when God came to Abraham who was very old and told him that his wife, Sarah, who was also very old, was going to have a baby. And you know what Sarah did? Take a guess. What do you think Sarah did? She was over here. She was in the other room kind of listening. She did what? Laugh. She laughed. She thought that was the funniest thing she'd ever heard. She said, I'm way too old to have a baby. She didn't know that God is a God of surprises. God's a God of surprises. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> God, thank you that you are full of surprises. You meet us in special, unexpected ways. Help us to have eyes that see and ears that listen so that we can see you, maybe in places where we wouldn't expect, maybe in ways we wouldn't expect. You want to bless us and you want to show your love to us. Help us to not miss your gifts because we miss the surprise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys, what do you see? Thank you.
Good morning. I'm filling in for Judy P. this morning. She and Ray are traveling. And I just want to say happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. My own father, Angus Wilkes, he was a wonderful father. And, but he used to do something that my sisters and I weren't particularly fond of. And my mother was, she was right there beside of him. Uh, it would be almost like a lot of Saturday nights, they would say, okay, let's get in the car. We're going to go visit such and such a family. And we'd be like, oh, no, please, please don't make us go. We promise you, let us stay home. We'll be good. And he would say to that, get in the car. So we would get in the car and go to these people's homes. And a lot of times they didn't have children or, you know, we would like listen to their, what we consider to be boring conversations or we would play in the yard. And anyway, we did that for many years, even when we were grown, it seemed like. And I'll tell you, my dad passed on and he went to Jesus when he was only 64 years old. And the men whose homes we visited became like fathers to me when I needed a father the most. So today I say, I'm so thankful that my dad said, get in the car. <laughs> And I'm just so thankful for all the men. A lot of those men sit in this church. Some of them are not in this church, but I've had many fathers throughout the years, and I'm thankful for fathers. I'm especially thankful for our Heavenly Father. So, praise and prayer concerns this morning. Okay, Ginger. My son, Matt, is doing what he's been wanting to do since he was four years old. He's down at Fort Rucker, Alabama, learning to fly attack helicopters. And I'm really happy for him and really proud of him, but his unit's gonna be deploying to Afghanistan in nine months. So naturally, I'm a little uptight about that. Um, and I'd just like to ask the church to keep him covered in prayers through his training and also for when he deploys in nine months. Okay, for Matt all of our servicemen and women. Okay. Eddie. Pray for all the fathers in this world for getting us through what, when we need it most. Amen, Eddie. All right. Here we go, Mr. Fritz. Yes, I'd like to let the, uh, Greg Cooper who was a, he worked with my son for the last four and a half years, and he's had early uh, diagnosis of ALS, and we all know that you know his father also died of that, and so Greg and his family are going to be in for a long haul, and we just lift up uh, not only Greg but he's got four children at home and a wife that that. Uh, we're hoping that God will and just bless in so many ways. Greg Cooper. It's only a year younger than I am. Okay. Oh, right here, Kennedy. Right here on the front row. Here. I thank you for the prayers last week. Ren had a great time at Camp Seagull, and our older son, Layton, is on wildlife camp um, this week with 50 middle schoolers on a bus they left yesterday, 10 hour drive. Um, so I pray for those kids and their leaders this week. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right, that's Layton. And Ryan, glad to see you back, little buddy. Right, and Sarah over here. Sarah. That's the easy way, Bill. Yeah. Um, just wanted to ask prayers for Patty Jackson and her family. Patty Jackson and that family need our prayers. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Valerie over here. Valerie. Um, I would like to lift up prayers for my sister Vicki Buckman. Um, she has been battling something we still have undiagnosed um, for a while. She has been at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester since last Sunday, and they're running all kinds of tests. She was supposed to come home yesterday, 
but they're not done testing, so it'll be at least Wednesday before she gets home. So if y'all will just keep her and Buck and all of our family in your prayers. Thank you. Yeah, Vicki Buckman, I know she covets our prayers. Okay. I would like to thank the congregation for your cards and your prayers. Um, our recent surgery was successful. A great part, I think, based on the things that you did for me, the recovery is doing very well. Thank you for standing up for that, Mr. Beal. Okay. Anyone else? Is that it? Okay, and I know we all have unspoken requests and um, that the Lord knows he is our Heavenly Father and he loves us and cares for us so much and we're so thankful that he hears our prayers. So we pray to him the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I find I'm not quite as freewheeling as your pastors. I need a little, little support here. And uh, the Old Testament lesson for this week in the lectionary happens to be the story of the first father of the nations, the father of the Hebrews, Abraham. Appropriate for a Father's Day to have this passage from the 18th chapter of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran for the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour kneaded and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abram, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord for the, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you indeed are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
A couple had two boys, eight and ten, who were sort of mischievous. In fact, uh, they were so often getting into trouble that whenever anything happened in the town, they knew that their sons were probably involved. <laughs> the, mother's, the boy's mother had heard that in, there was a clergyman in town who was particularly good at discipline. And so she asked if he would speak to her boys. The clergyman agreed but wanted to see them one at a time. So the mother sent her eight-year-old in to see him the following morning, intending to send the older boy in the afternoon. The clergyman was a huge man with a booming voice. Sounds like someone we know. (laughs) And the younger boy sat down and the pastor sternly asked, Where is God? The boy's mouth dropped open, but he made no response. The clergyman repeated the question in an even sterner tone. Where is God? The boy made no attempt to answer again. The clergyman got to his feet, shaking his finger in the face of the boy. He said, where is God? At which point the boy screamed, bolted from the room, ran to his house, got into the closet, and hid in the furthest corner of the closet until his older brother found him there a few minutes later. What happened, he said. The younger boy, gasping for breath, said, We're in big trouble this time, dude. God is missing, and they think we took him. (laughs) Uh, Laughter. What a gift. You heard this one? Uh, Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent, and I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed, and from, and from then on, I'm going to need your help. Amen. What a wonderful gift laughter is from God. Even the bad jokes we hear on Sunday morning at the men's breakfast, you know, it's a gift we get from God. You and I are made in the image of God, so declares Genesis. And if we're made in the image of God, God must have a sense of humor. If we have any doubt about that, or ever thought that God was only serious, we ought to consider this ancient story of Abraham and Sarah. Those two were caught laughing by God. In fact, it was God who made them laugh. Abram had been promised by God that he would make him a great nation. Twice he had made the promise before this. More people than the stars of heaven. More people than the sands on the seashore. But he was getting old. Ninety-nine he was now. And so was Sarah, and no child yet. His name had been changed from God, from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means father of many, or father of nations. But still, Sarah was barren. Abram and Sarah decided they would try to help God keep his promise. Sarah devised a plan. Do you remember? She sent her maid, Hagar, into Abram and allowed her to bear a child so as to fulfill the promise. And so Ishmael was born. At least now Abram had a son and a chance for descendants. You have a sense that in the Hebrew scriptures that God is snickering at the human attempts to set up, to sidestep the plans that God had made. So now, once again, God comes to visit and to reaffirm his promise. In the 18th chapter of Genesis, the narrator tells us at the beginning of the story something that Abram himself doesn't know. Abram doesn't find out later that it's God who's coming to him. All he finds is three men standing in front of his tent. 
by the tree. Three men coming to visit in the heat of the day. Now, ancient Near East hospitality said that you should do whatever you can for those who are traveling near your place of abode. And Abraham wanted to fulfill that sense of hospitality. Later on in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded that one never knows when one offers hospitality who one might be offering hospitality to. That sometimes the stranger might indeed be God's presence right here in our midst. And this time it was true. So Abram saw three men. Finally, one who the listener knows is God says to him, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah's over in the other side of the tent or the other tent. She's fixing some cakes for the men. And she's well past the age of bearing children. It says so in the scripture. She's not having even hot flashes anymore. She's long past. And the fact for her is that even Abraham, who is 99, is not going to be very much help as she sees it in this conception business. She laughs. She laughs. And who wouldn't laugh at such an unbelievable, incredible news that she has just heard? The visitor has stretched the limits of reality beyond the ordinary bounds of sense and reason. The laughter of Abraham and Sarah indicates their realization that something extraordinary is on the loose. Something so unbelievable that laughter is the best, even perhaps the most faithful thing they could do at the moment. Grace can do that to a person. Grace can do that to a person. Make you laugh. You remember some moment when grace so moved you that you couldn't but smile or chuckle or let loose with a belly laugh? Sometimes we religious types get too serious with our theology and with this faith of ours. God is in the business of making us laugh just by his grace. Just think about it. Here's a 99-year-old man about to be a father. I'm 70 and a grandfather, and I can barely do that. I can't hardly keep up with those six and four-year-old granddaughters that I got here in Washington, North Carolina, which is what brought me here, let alone think about being a father at 99. Incredible. And Sarah, in that day and age, not to have a child, not to have a son, was the sense, there was a sense that you were cursed. And it had been promised and she had hoped and planned and dreamed and now somehow it was going to happen when she was well beyond the possibility. What else could you do but laugh? Which is what she did. Think about it. Every day is a gift. Should cause us at least to smile if not to laugh. Every day, every morning that you wake up from your bed is a day of wonder, a day of joyous possibilities. I had an African-American clergy woman in one of my, uh, one of my towns where I served, and, and she was an older woman, and she would always pray this way. I, every time I heard her pray, she would pray, Oh, thank you, Lord, that my bed was not my cooling board. You know, she was not laid out on some cooling board somewhere that morning. She was just grateful to be alive. What a wonderful prayer to say at the beginning of every day. What wondrous things there are to see and to do. What wonderful relationships we have in our families. If 
fathers and mothers, children, aunts and uncles, what gifts they are. And in the larger family of the church, what a wonderful gift it is to have some surrogate fathers and grandfathers around to help in that process of raising our kids. You want to talk about laughter. Just think about the fact that part of the job of helping our kids to grow up is given to men who never grow up. You got it. Just think about that. You know, we're going to help them grow up and we can't stop being kids ourselves. And yet it's true. In fact, maybe that's the gift we have to give them. That gift of just being a kid still, always, maybe forever. Grace is such a gift. As that song we sang a while ago said, just to think that he died for me. Sometimes it makes us cry. Sometimes it it makes us feel heavy in our heart that someone cared enough about me to do that, but you know, it maybe ought to make you laugh a bit too. You know, just look in the mirror some morning and say to yourself, Jesus died for that? You know, not just your face, but your heart and your mind and your actions and your life. You know, isn't that enough to make you laugh? With great joy, this is the God whose grace is so wonderful that it's enough to make us laugh. Grace, that unmerited, unearned love of God, ought to produce a belly laugh in us. I probably had one of my most significant grace moments during an Emmaus walk. I had been in a church in State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State was. It was a church that had about 800 worshiping regularly on Sunday morning in three different services. And I had a number of people who had gone on Emmaus Walk, and they said, you got to go, you got to go, you got to do this. And I said, eh, you know, not me, I don't need that. Being a United Methodist clergy person, I had made a commitment at one point in my life as I was ordained to go wherever the bishop sent me. And in the spring of that year, the bishop called to say, you're going to get a call from a superintendent tomorrow and you're going to do the right thing, I know it. (laughs) Ooh, that was not good news. I did not want to move. I wanted to stay there till I retired. It was a young, vibrant community of college kids, and it was exciting to be there, and I was not ready to leave. Had no reason to want to leave. But we're committed to going where we're sent. That's what we say we'll do, and that's what we do. I got the call the next day, and it was to a congregation that had just lost its pastor to early death. He was a good friend of mine. We had grown up in the same hometown, and they needed someone to come and help with the healing, and that's where I ended my ministry in Pennsylvania, and it was a wonderful congregation, so full of energy for mission that I couldn't have been in a better place, but I didn't know that at the time. All I knew was I didn't want to go, thank you. I want to stay right where I was. So one young man in the congregation said, there's an Emmaus walk this spring. I think you ought to go. I said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, you really ought to go. I don't want to do that. You really ought to go. He kept coming, and I finally relented and said, all right, I'll go. He picked me up, took me to the Emmaus walk, and I had such a weekend as I have never had in my whole life. The theme of the weekend was the story of the prodigal son. You know it well. Father, two sons. A father who's willing to do anything for his children. A father who, like our father, loves his children deeply enough to let them go and enough to hold on to them when they come back. Two sons, one that ran away, discovered that he had made a mistake, came home, said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry and got forgiveness and an embrace and became a 
child of the family again. What a glorious story. But there's another brother in that story. The one who always stayed home, who always did everything right, who always followed the father's directions and never had a party. You remember that, son? Guess who that was? That weekend, I discovered that I'd been living the older brother's story. Not so much that I resented my younger brother having grace, but failing to realize that grace had been in my life all the time. There was a party ready for me any moment, and I didn't take it. And I just, when it came on, when it hit me in the middle of the weekend, I cried first, of course. And then I started to smile, and before it was all over that weekend, I was laughing such deep laughter, full of such deep joy, that I'll remember it for all eternity. What a gift it was. This is the God who can make us laugh if we just open ourselves up to possibilities. I know that there are some of you, I hear your stories, I hear the prayer concerns, who are finding it hard to laugh right now. But do you remember what it said at the end of that scripture? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Sometimes that's translated, is anything too hard for the Lord? In a later story in the first chapter of Luke, when an elderly woman named Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah are about to have a repeat of the story of Abraham and Sarah, there's a passage where Mary hears the angel say, is anything impossible with God? This is a God who not only makes us laugh at grace, but who wants to turn those difficult moments of our life into reason for laughter too. Is there anything too hard for this God? Abraham and Sarah never got over their laughter. And when the child of promise was born, they named him Isaac. And do you know what Isaac translates to? What it means? It means laughter. The son of laughter to a couple who didn't believe it was possible from a God who knew it was. Let's pray. God, touch us with your grace and your joy so that we might find reasons to laugh deeply, to rejoice wonderfully, to celebrate outrageously at what you do. Bless us and make us laugh. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes to the Corinthians, for I received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, how the Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you, eat it in remembrance of me. And the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them and said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink this bread and this cup, you do lift up the Lord until he comes again. O Lord, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. By your Spirit, bless us and these gifts 
In the name of Jesus, amen. Isn't it interesting that when Abraham met the strangers, he offered them something to eat? Cake, something to drink, a sign of hospitality, and they gave him so much more. Isn't it wonderful the way in which when we receive uh, these gifts, God comes to us again? This table is the United Methodist table. It's open to anyone. You're all welcome. Just need to have a humble heart and the willingness to recept, receive this good gift from God. Today we will receive these gifts by intinction. You'll receive a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. As you go by, you may stop to kneel to pray on the way back to your seats, maybe even asking for the gift of laughter in your life. For those who are serving in the praise band, will you come and be served? Let us stand. Just now, Lord, wash.
خوش می as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way Lord have thine own way hold o'er my being absolute sway filled with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share. But our toil he doth richly repay Not a grief or a loss Not a crown or a cross But is blessed if we trust and obey Trust and obey For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear that word? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit that can do amazing things in you and through you be with you now and always. Go in his love. Go with his laughter. Amen. Oh, he's a long time God, yes he is 
Job said, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's a long time God. Yes, he is. You can ask the children of Israel, trapped at the Red Sea, by that mean old Pharaoh and his army. They had water all around them and Pharaoh on their track. From out of nowhere, God stepped in and cut a highway just like that. He's a long time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's a long time God. Yes, he is. Job said, you may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right all time. He's an all-time God. Yes, he is. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, they were in a mess to see. The king had thrown them in the stove and they divided his big decree. But just before they turned to toast, God made the king the fool. Oh, God himself jumped in that fire and made it really cool. Cool! He's an on time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an on time God. Yes, he is. Job said, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right all time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. You ask old Simon Peter, stepping around the boat. Twain waves crashed all around, but still he stayed afloat. Then suddenly his faith gave way, he was drowning in the sea. But Jesus saved him, and he'll do the same for you and me. Yeah, he's an old time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an old time God. Yes, he is. Job said, he may not come when you want him. Yes, he is.